When we get into a discussion about angels, we run into a problem right away, and that is terminology. Now, my book, yeah, you know, we use the word angels in the title because that's good for searching, but the subtitle is really significant and it's deliberate what the Bible really says about God's heavenly host. And the reason that I wanted that subtitle is that all members of God's heavenly host are not angels. And that sounds weird, again, to the, the, the average person in church or the pupil, what, what else would they be? Well, you essentially have three semantic buckets. The first one is there are terms in the Old Testament that describe what a member of the heavenly host is by nature. So this would be terminology like spirits. They're spiritual beings. They don't have bodies like we do. The second bucket would be terms that really deal with status and hierarchy, sort of where they fit in God's bureaucracy. But then you have a third bucket, and this is really where most of the terminology falls. Uh, these would be terms to describe function or role, essentially their job descriptions. Uh, angel actually belongs in this bucket because it's not what a member of the heavenly host is, even though that's the way we're used to using it, but angel is not what a thing is, it's what that member of the heavenly host does. Again, it's a job description. Uh, cherubim, you know, cherub, seraph, seraphim. It's the same kind of thing. That Those terms are drawn from respectively uh, Akkadian or Babylonian, and uh, the other one is Egyptian, but they're, they're terms that describe throne guardians, the protectors of sacred space. In the human world, these would be those who protect the king, but also make sure that no riffraff essentially comes near him. You know, God doesn't need any assistance or anyone to do any tasks, but God does this, again, with the beings he has created. He makes them partners and they have functions uh, to, you know, do what God wants done on his behalf in conjunction with him. And this is one of those roles. So there are a number of these terms in the Old Testament that, des that describe what a member of the heavenly host might do on any given occasion. It is important to know that the terminology is quite varied and quite diverse, and again, fits in these three buckets, what a thing is, where a thing ranks, what a thing does, okay? So that's important often because of the rebellions, because some of those terms, those, those members of the heavenly host that had a particular job, they're gonna lose that job and then they're gonna get something else, they're gonna be referred to as something else, and that'll matter later on in the Bible in some passage. For the good guys, there will be terminology that interestingly enough, stops in the New Testament with the supernatural members of the heavenly host and actually gets transferred to human believers. So it, it's kind of significant to pay attention to the vocabulary because it will help us get a, a fuller sense of something later on, especially when it comes to ourselves, again, how God looks at, at humans, because there's this symbiotic relationship between God's heavenly family and his heavenly partners and God's earthly family and his earthly partners. Those two things are connected in several ways by terminology. And it's often obscured in our English Bibles and we sort of miss the theology that arises from that. Let's start with the Hebrew term ruach, spirit. Again, this is a term that belongs in that first bucket, terms that tell you what a member of the heavenly host is by nature. They are spiritual beings. They don't have bodies like we do. Another one would be the Hebrew word malach. This is where we get angel because malach is a messenger. That's what the term means. And so in English Bibles, it will get translated messenger, typically when they're human or when the translator thinks they're human. And when they're not human, English translators typically opt for angel because that's familiar to us in our vocabulary. But at the end of the day, that is a bucket number three term. That's a job description. It tells you what a thing does. Another example of a bucket one uh, term would be shemayim. This is the Hebrew word for heavens or heavenly ones. Now this is, like, this is actually kind of interesting because there are passages in the Old Testament that typically in English Bibles would get translated as heavens, like the sky, the place. 
you can, and some scholars do in certain passages, translate that instead as heavenly ones, okay, to sort of make it animate or make it like a personal being. And that's legitimate. So as you're reading your English Bible, sometimes you'll want to pay attention to how an English translator will treat that term. And just to know that, you know, in some cases you might actually have heavenly ones pointing to figures or entities as opposed to just the sky. Job 38, seven and eight is an important passage because it's a pretty clear instance of using the way that the Old Testament writers, and this, again, they're part of the ancient Near Eastern culture uh, generally, they would use the language of astronomy or celestial language, stellar language for members of the heavenly host. For instance, in, in Job 38, seven and eight, we have the sons of God, again, heavenly beings of you know, considerable rank, also described as the stars of God. And this isn't the only place in scripture this happens. And you say, well, why would, I mean, that's just kind of weird. We know that stars are balls of gas and, and, and things like that. Well, it, again, the, the passage isn't trying to undo science or do bad science. That isn't the point. The point is, again, that God up there in the heavens where God lives. And, and again, we, we, we imagine God living in the heavens for a number of reasons, a number of passages in the Bible. But God is up there, and so his servants his spirit being servants also are up there. And so to talk about them, biblical writers will use the analogy of stars and celestial objects in the sky. You know, they don't have telescopes, they don't have modern science. This is just a convenience, a convenient way of talking about them up there with God who are in service to him and sometimes are in service to us. There are passages that really take the, the astronomical language and sort of animate it or, or make the stars alive you know, while they're doing so. I think the most familiar connection here is apocalyptic language. You know, falling stars, stones of fire, you know, this, this cataclysmic like language. And we're prone to literalize that and say, oh, at the, the time of the end, you know, like the heavens are just going to like go, you know, freak out. And we're going to get asteroid storms here and stuff. That really isn't the point. The point is that in the end of time, God is going to judge the spiritual world as well as the earthly world. An ancient person, including, you know, Israelites, especially if they're not you know, sort of theological thinkers, just the average Joe, okay, the average Joe Ben Shmo or whatever, you know, Israelite. Yeah, it's very possible that they could look up in the skies and especially when stars move or they see an object move like a, like a meteor or a comet, it's very possible they could look at that and without the, the scientific knowledge we have think, well, that's alive because it moves. Living things move. And so they, they could you know, use the language and interpret the language of scripture that way. It doesn't have to be interpreted that way, but that's entirely possible. Ultimately, the, the star language is a really useful metaphor. We, unfortunately, are not used to reading scripture and really even thinking about language in ways other than literalness. Again, whatever even that term means. You know, this one-to-one -one correspondence, I see a term, the first thing that pops into my head, that's what it means. And usually the first thing that pops into your head is the sort of the physicalized meaning of a particular word. Uh, it's really unfortunate because it's actually a, a very useful metaphor. And, and the biblical writers do this all the time. Uh, Leviathan, the beast of the sea, that was a well-known metaphor for chaos, because the sea is a frightening place, you can't live in it. Things in the natural world become useful for conveying ideas, abstract ideas. And the stellar language of scripture is another one of these. Again, useful for conveying the fact that God isn't alone up there, he has living beings up there with him, and God is acting and active. Another term we could talk about is kedoshim. This is a plural term, it just means holy ones. And it's typically used in the plural as sort of a collective. So if you are a member of the heavenly host and you're not in rebellion, <laughs> you are 
a holy one, and collectively you are the holy ones. Now, we have to remember that holiness doesn't necessarily, and, and really doesn't, I would say, almost at all, very, very unusual it would be to have that term refer to moral perfection. And there's only one perfect being, and that's God. God is the standard, therefore, for holiness. What the term actually means is set apart, uh, separated, sacred, assigned to God's use. Okay, and this is what they are, if you really think about it. God has created beings in the spiritual world who are to serve him. They are set apart for his service. And so Holy Ones is a way of expressing that idea. Again, not canceling out the possibility because they are less than God. It doesn't cancel out the possibility that they could fail and that they could do wrong. We know from scripture that there are members of the heavenly host who do fail, who do rebel. So the term Holy Ones doesn't cancel that out.